has a randomized feature. It, it does have a randomized <laughs> feature, exactly. Um, and when it's used, now you can use it to be to make some really crazy random sounds, but I think it's actually better to use for really sort of a subtle change in your beat. So I mean, it, to be honest, the way that the kit is now, it sounds incredibly realistic. You've, I mean, it's got um, many variations of same velocity hits for all drums, so up to six sometimes. And uh, so if you're playing a the snare drum over and over again, it's it's, it's going through six variations. Yep, yeah, okay. exactly. And it and it randomizes between those as well. So it, so it's not like it necessarily goes from one to six and then rotates. It's, it's already jumping around a little bit. Exactly. Before the randomized feature we've even Okay. Yep, exactly. Um, so yeah, so you so you've got these variations here, but but then if you add the randomization, like you can even you can make it even more varied if you just if you make it really subtle. So for right now it's like you know, it already sounds very nice. But then if you turn this on and then you know make the volume and I, pitch is one of my favorite pitch and EQ. Okay, just, random, you're randomizing volume, randomizing pitch a little exactly. bit, randomizing EQ. Okay. Exactly. So it, so it takes all these parameters, randomizes them a little bit each time, and then it, I mean, it, it. The thing is, it's actually quite subtle, so it's not even you can't really hear it. But it's more of like a subconscious thing. It makes it even more. Like, so it makes it even more varied, and, and it doesn't sound unrealistic. Now, is it processing the sample in real time to do that? It does process the samples in real time, but it's it's uh, it's very light on the CPU as far as the way that it works. Okay. So it just it uses a standard contact uh, volume and then uh, EQ and pitch setting, and it sort of randomizes the scripting. Actually, in contact is probably that that's how this all comes together. All of these performance pages. So the scripting will take care of that. The scripting like it sets the randomized ranges and then and then makes it so every hit you do it it sets it at a different place within that randomized range. Gotcha. Okay. So you can make it sound like a, a really bad drummer too, if you randomize it enough. You can. Should I demonstrate yeah, that? Yeah, let's do So let's see, if we make it, uh, timing is one. Timing actually, it's at a very subtle level, is very nice because it's you can add, it's just a slight bit of humanization, especially in things like funk or other, like if you just delay it a little bit, it's quite nice. But if you if you go very high, it can it can really set things off. So it, the other thing, exclude direct mics makes it so that um, if you include direct mics with a randomization, it, it's much more, you can notice it, it's much more it's obvious. obvious yeah. mm -hmm. But if you don't include the direct mics, uh, if you exclude them basically, then uh, it, it's, it's, you're sort of randomizing more of the room and the overhead, but not the direct. So each sound has a different characteristic, but you don't really know why. Gotcha. So if you do, if you make it so you include the direct mics and then you change the pitch and you change the EQ really randomly. And I mean, you know, we're going nuts here, but you know. So. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. it, it's, it's not really usable, but no, if, if you take off the timing, let's make it a little bit better. So, I mean, it's still even not terrible. No, you know? it's, it's not it's, terrible it's, enough. It just sort of sounds like a drummer doesn't really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could maybe make it even more extreme, but okay, that's yeah. a, well, that's pretty <laughs> exciting. And then you have one of these uh, curves up here, more of a velocity. This is yeah. This is uh, more for player preference, mm -hmm. especially. It's actually it's well, it's both for keyboards and for V drums essentially. Okay. So like. If you're a if you're a very hard hitter, you know you might want to do this curve where you takes it only when you get to the very end you really hit those hard. Or the opposite if you've either got a, a keyboard or you just play really light, then even if you just you play really light, it already hits the pretty loud velocities. So and then uh, I typically just keep it on. This is if you want to set it to a single velocity, and then over here you can actually put it to the exact velocity that you want it to be, and then it'll always play at that same velocity for all hits. Okay. And then this is a, an extra, this is if you want right now, there is no velocity to volume control, which means that if you play it at a quiet velocity, it plays it at the actual volume that the original samples were recorded at. So if they played really quietly, you're hearing that quiet sample. If you adjust this to, you know, to be a high level, it makes it so it, even even the quiet samples will play even quieter and the louder samples will play louder. Oh, so it extends the... Uh, exactly. Oh, exactly. okay. Typically though, I mean, this, this is only necessary if you really want to, like if you really depending on your playing style. Again, I, typically this would be the way that it sounds the most realistic. I see. So yeah, in a loud rock context, right. that control is not going to be really that useful. E exactly. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in solo context, it might be. It could be, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In fact, there's one sort of a major feature, actually, that I, I like a lot is this snare bleed mic. Uh -huh. and oh, yeah, this I heard is, a little bit of that earlier. Um, if you, let's see, how the best way to do this. So like right now, well, that's, that's the snare itself, but like, not much snare bleed, but then you can. We actually recorded those samples coming from the snares, so you hear now the buzz of the oh, snare yeah. coming in on those. So all of the the kicks, toms, and hi hats all have snare bleed, so you can really like all the sound that came in through the bottom 
snare mic is then there, and so all the buzz is there. So, which I usually keep this at a high level. Actually. I was gonna say that that's got a really realistic sound. Yeah, but that especially means that... with the open kit, because even yeah, it's yeah. just it's just all the the more noise the better from the kit. I well, think, yeah, personally, that's your, that's your seventy sound. But then you have uh, the drummer who recorded this had to play that set of samples even one more time. Is that how that works? No, actually, he it was all done at the same time. So he recorded, so he would hit the normal tom sound, and then we kept the snare mic on, the bottom snare mic, and so it recorded those exact same samples. I see. So the hit that you hear in the tom would be the same hit that you hear through the snare mic, so you're just but mixing with a that, lot of buzz. You're just mixing that other sample in exactly. a little bit. Exactly. Yep. And it was separated so much that, that if you turn it all the way down, you can almost not hear the snare at all in the other mics. So it was a really nice separation as far as that's concerned. How long altogether did it take you to, from recording to, to this point here? Oh, yeah, <laughs> a long time. Yeah, I would say the team was an average of four people at any given time. Um, and it took about, about three months. Mm -hmm. So of everything from the starting point to lining up all the tracks in, in our, in our uh, a DAW to you know, slicing them each at the right point and then, you know, uh, the, the scripting was actually a huge task, so there's uh, other scripting experts here, so Nikki Veronik, uh, mm -hmm. Dinos Valianatos, and uh, Adam Hanley. And they're actually, they're working on these scripts a lot, so they're making it so that, that all of these functions are actually, you know, so that everything you see in the performance view is actually, that you can, you can it all functions. You know, all, all of these functions, the, the way that the drums work, are done in these performance views. Right. So the, the scripting took an extremely long time, and it was done for the 60s drums and as well as the 70s drums. Like the 60s drums, there was a, it was sort of the, the basic, okay, a lot of these things had to be set up, and, and that took a really long time. And then for the 70s, like all of it had to be updated for these new kits mm -hmm. and things. Was it easier to do the 70s drums than the 60s drums, now that you kind of have a, a system going? Or is it present I would different say problems? Yes. Yeah, I mean, no, definitely, yeah, but that's the thing, is that, that uh, we learned a lot from the 60s drums, so then the efficiency with the 70s drums was a lot faster, both in the recording process as well as the, as well as the instrument creation process. So what's the difference between the 60s and 70s drums, then? Well, 60s drums, I mean, obviously, goes back even further in time, so you've got, um, you've got even more, uh, I guess I could say even more vintage, because it's further back, so... Um, in that case, less mics were used. Like for the early 60s kit, there was actually just the mono overhead and the kick direct mic, and that was it. And that's what they used for early 60s. And then late 60s, they started to add other things, like they added tom direct mics, uh, a snare bottom mic, and I think that's it. And in, and in both cases, they also had direct mics for the percussion, because typically percussion was actually played by like the singer, you mm -hmm. know, so not, you know, the, the sitting with a tambourine or, or something like that. So we had direct mics in the percussion as well. Um, and then as far as the actual kits themselves, um, the 70s drums has sort of a polarizing kit. So we've got like the big open kit and then we've got the small tight kit. And that's, it's a really, like two extremely different sounds, both very useful. Right, yeah. And then the 60s, now they were both very different sounding kits, but they were, it, it wasn't sort of that kind of polarizing sound that the 70s had for the two different types of sounds. So it was more of a, um, it was just a, two very different sounding kits, but in the same recording setup. So it was also in Studio 2 and, and sort of, uh, it was more similar, I would say, to the setup of the open kit, where it was it was more, where we recorded the, the ambient samples and, it, and it, it wasn't like closed off or anything like that. I see. And, and the techniques, the vintage techniques for, the, for those two kits, like if you use the vintage version of those kits, because we provide the full kit versions and the vintage kit versions, the vintage kit versions of those sound very different. I see. Were those recorded in Abbey Road as well? They were. Mm -hmm. okay. In the same in Studio, in studio two. 2 as well. Yeah, exactly. Awesome.